worked at the University of Eindhoven and did uh, my work on, on a PhD in computer science. Uh, so yeah, I hope everybody had a nice lunch. Uh, I'm familiar with the post-lunch dip, so I'm going to make everything as easy as possible and show you lots of pictures. Um, uh, the presentation will be as follows. I will talk about the, re the research that I've been doing and share the experiences that I had in the area of data visualization and network intrusion detection. Um, I will also give you some live demos of systems that we have developed. And if people have any questions, then feel free to, uh, to ask them right away. But before we actually go to the, uh, the project description, let's have a look at some headlines. So a nuclear meltdown uh, in a, a nuclear facility in Iran. Uh, the New York Times had got attacked for four months and a nationwide attack on the German parliament. So these are just a few uh, examples of headlines that we see almost daily in the news. Computer viruses are getting more and more complex and hackers nowadays are willing to spend a lot of effort and resources uh, to develop highly specialized viruses that will only work once. And when they work once, they will cause a lot of damage. And current antivirus software actually has a lot of issues in dealing with these viruses, because usually a virus attack needs to happen first in order to know how to recognize it the next time. So um, with respect to science, there is a lot of uh, questions on how to develop new kinds of techniques. So how do these uh, targeted attacks work? And so in general, there are three phases. We have the infiltration phase, where the virus is trying to enter the network. And this is typically by means of social engineering, huh? a malicious USB drive, sending an email, uh, that uh, can inject the virus into the network. Then the second part is the, the, the expansion phase, where the virus is trying to locate the system that it, wants to, uh, that it wants to harm. And from there, there are basically two possibilities. Either the virus stays under the radar and leads, uh, leaks information to the outside world, or it will try to disrupt services in the network for some other strategic benefits. Although infiltration is nearly impossible to prevent, we can detect signs of the expansion phase and sabotage phase by actively analyzing the network traffic that is sent between these messages, between the computers. Um, so how can we actually find these kind of viruses? So for this, we do network traffic analysis. And there are basically three different levels in which you can do this. And so we can literally look at the zeros and ones that are transferred over the lines. But like I said, these viruses are very targeted, which means that they are using very application-specific uh, vulnerabilities to get inside your system. So we need to dig even deeper. And then you have the flow analysis, where you have some IP and TCP information that can tell you where the messages are coming from and on what kind of protocol is being used. But the messages themselves are still a black box. So we need to dig even deeper to get uh, to find these targeted attacks. And this is when we end up in the semantic analysis, where you also gain insight in the application-specific protocols that are being used, uh, such as, for instance, Samba, if you want to access network files over the, uh, on, your, on your hard disk drive. So how can we actually obtain this data? For this, we used Wireshark. So what we did uh, at the university was we took lots of network recordings uh, in PCAP format, then we run them through Wireshark, and Wireshark is basically a dissector that can give us a lot of inf meta inf metadata about a packet. So basically what we end up with is a huge table where every row corresponds to a network packet, and a column corresponds to a field, a protocol field that can be present in these packets. And you see that uh, TCP and IP information is nearly always present, uh, but if the more we go to the right, we end up in the application-specific area, and then uh, certain fields may be missing or uh, be present. So uh, network traffic analysis involves the analysis of many different types of fields, but not only fields. And you can imagine thousands of network packets are being tra transferred every second over this network, so this also gives a big burden on how to analyze this properly. So this is more or less the summary of my PhD. So the university gave me this huge table and said, go find me some viruses, and here's some money in four years. Uh, good luck, have fun. So, okay, well, so what's basically the problem that we're looking into? Basically, I have a bunch of network messages, um, some of which are good, some of which are bad. And as a human, I can perfectly find these bad packets. And if I keep digging long enough in my data, then eventually I will find something uh, that is truly out of the ordinary. However, if I'm dealing with 1,000 events per second, 1,000 packets per second, then this becomes unbearable. Well, on the other hand, we have full automated techniques, so why not use them? Well, it actually turns out that uh, these automated techniques are very fast and can also find these bad network messages, but it, they are also generating some false alarms. And typically, the number of false alarms, uh, if, you are, uh, if you have systems where thousands, pa thousands of packets per second are being sent, and uh, even the error rate of such an algorithm is 1%, then this still results into 10 alarms per second. 
So basically, you shift the problem from analyzing the, the network messages manually to analyzing the alerts that are coming from this algorithm. So that also does not work. So this raised the question, can we somehow combine the two? Can we combine the intelligence of the human with the speed of automated techniques to make sure that this network intrusion detection becomes more efficient? So I was kind of naive because, yeah, I am a data visualization guy. Uh, I create pictures of images and uh, I was wondering like, okay, why do we need visualization in the first place? Uh, we have uh, artificial intelligence nowadays or whatever buzzword you would like to call it. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's do some anomaly detection. Let's try to find these viruses. And if we look in the literature, then there are basically three classes of anomalies that we can find. And so very abstract, uh, again, academia, uh, we have lots of uh, network packets and some packets are, uh, if we represent them as dots on the screen, uh, dots that are standing far away from the other ones, uh, is, we can assume that these are rather odd. And to make it a bit more concrete, huh, if I have a network log where somebody is always sending messages of type A and suddenly he's sending a message of type B, and then we can say that this B is rather strange with respect to the rest. Well, to make it a little bit more complex, because this is not rocket science, we, there are also contextual anomalies. So now, instead of having dots, we also have squares and we have colors. And if I'm now starting analyzing this data by, for instance, grouping this data by shape, then we can see we have an equal amount of squares and circles. So uh, there is no reason to say that anything suspicious is happening here. But if we start analyzing this from, based on the color property, then we can see that there is one standing out. Um, in an event log, this can look as follows. I have, for instance, an, uh, somebody who is always sending A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Um, but if I, for instance, then group the data based on the recipient of the, uh, of, of, the, of the guy who's receiving the message, then what we can see is that user one is always doing this sending of A messages, and user two is always sending the B messages. But then we can see that this guy is now also sending an A message that, with respect to the behavior of this user, is, is fairly odd. And yeah, people can wonder, like, okay, why the heck are you telling me this in the first place? Well, this is actually a very fundamental thing that is. Uh, that, that, that what makes that, that, that's something that what makes fully automated analysis very difficult, because in network traffic I'm not having only two properties sh such as shape and color. Uh, uh, like I said, these tables that I'm working with they have hundreds of, of fields, and how should I know which of these fields to group on in order to find these outliers? So a basic a, a conclusion that we actually could make from this was that finding outliers in, in the data was not difficult at all. I could always find a certain grouping in the data where there are some things standing out, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's meaningful. So this is also a main reason why fully automated techniques cannot work on their own, because they are able to find all the outliers that you can think of, but then the main question lies, okay, which of these outliers are actually indicators of compromise in my system? So the third class of anomalies are collective ones. And think of these as where you have network messages A, B, and C that are not necessarily strange by themselves, but if they occur as a group together, they can be strange. I think, for instance, about a combustion engine where you have events such as uh, opening a gas valve or lighting a fire. Uh, the order in which these events happen matters. So uh, another motivation uh, to, to show you that may aut fully automated techniques are not always the solution. So this is, for instance, an example uh, of um, image classification. So when we have, for instance, a computer that has to tell us what can be shown on the image. And there's this algorithm, for instance, that can tell them with a 60% certainty that this is a panda on the picture. Uh, but the moment we start adding uh, a random noise picture to it and we combine it, we put it, the images on top of each other, then we can see from a visual perspective that nothing has changed, but the algorithm is now certain that it is a gibbon. And I have no idea what a gibbon is, but it's definitely not a panda. So, so if people are interested in this kind, uh, in, in, in flaws in automated techniques, especially in security, so every year uh, KPN is publishing an, uh, a, a, a European report um, where we also managed to, to write something in there. So if people are interested, there are also some nice stickers in there. Uh, you can take them in the front. So, okay, I, I hope to have motivated you that uh, the use of visualization is actually uh, makes sense. And there are two main reasons for this. First of all, we have very powerful computers inside our head. And so we are able to recognize images and patterns in images very quickly. And an example is shown on the left. It's on Comps Quadrat, where we have four data sets that are statistically identical. So the, they have the same averages, they have the same standard deviations, 
if you would apply a machine learning model onto it, then you can see that the blue line is exactly the same in all the four images. But we can clearly see from a visual perspective that there are some other properties that were not captured by the automated techniques. And second of all, a network operator is there for a reason. If you think about the uh, the network operators said uh, they, they know more than all the, than, than just the data that is happening. And they are aware of things, uh, for instance, the shutdown of a computer last week that may have caused uh, other types of network packets to, to occur. And this is something that uh, fully automated techniques may not necessarily incorporate in their analysis. So as a user, we, uh, it, it's our job to help these automated techniques to, uh, imp to improve results. So just to give you an illustration that data visualization is not just about the creation of static images. These are three systems that we have designed over the last few years. Uh, and, and one of the uh, systems I'm going to actually give you a live demo on how these works. But the most important thing here is that if you have generated an image and you see something strange, you immediately want to know what's wrong with it and what, uh, what, what, what's going on. So data visualization is more about creating an interface for the user to uh, select these things that they are interested in, immediately get more information by means of other types of visualizations or a simple export function to, uh, to Excel to, to do further analysis. So I, I hope that the images were uh, as, as flickery as possible as you could imagine. The, that, that, that was the goal of this. So th there's a lot of interaction involved in these systems. We will, we will see this in, uh, in, in the demo. So basically what we're, what we're doing in, uh, in this research is how uh, we take the network traffic from these environments, we convert them in a huge Excel file, and these Excel files we're going to visualize. And just to show you that these techniques do not limit themselves to just network traffic, as an example for the demo, I'm going to, uh, uh, we are going to work on something completely different. No, no, no. This, uh, Excel has limitations. This, uh, no, no, no. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so for the, the, the type of data that we're going to look into um, is wildlife traffic. So this is actually part of an IEEE data challenge. It's an, a big international association that every year gives us a challenge to work on. Uh, people from industry and academia uh, can spend uh, three months of time to solve the challenge. And we're going to solve this now in uh, a few minutes. So the idea is as follows, so we have a wildlife preserve, uh, so there are vehicles traveling through the park, and each time a vehicle is passing through a gate, a lock is be, uh, an event is being generated. So on the left hand side we have a very simplistic uh, event lock where we can see every car is driving through a certain gate at a certain moment in time. And if we group these events uh, based on their car ID, then we can actually derive the travel patterns that these vehicles are doing in, in the park. So the assignment of the, for this challenge was to, uh, find, uh, to find an explanation why there was a bird species dying out. And um, well, the, we only had these car patterns, so we needed to come up with own hypotheses what, uh, what could have caused this. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, some knowledge about vehicles that are traveling through this park. So we have the personal vehicles that are visiting campings. We have trucks that deliver goods or are traveling right through the park because it's simply the shortest way uh, from A to B. And we have ranger vehicles that are responsible for the maintenance of the park. So all the current techniques that we have been working on, uh, they, they take an, uh, an anomaly detection algorithm, they produce lots of alerts, and then hindsight, there is this guy digging into the alerts to see which ones are interesting and which ones are not. In this experiment, we do it the other way around. So what we do is, as a human, we start with the analysis of the data, we mark things that we find interesting, and then in turn, automated techniques can use this information to help us find patterns and anomalies that we are interested in. Um, so we do this as follows. So for every row in our table, we create a block, and uh, rows that belong to the same vehicle are put into a sequence. So basically, if we transform the table from the left to the right, we have two sequences where there's one vehicle driving through four gates and the second vehicle driving through five gates. And if I apply this technique to the entire data set, then I basically end up with a huge collection of blocks. Okay, before we continue to do any uh, uh, analysis, so if you were the owner of a wildlife preserve, what kind of patterns would you find strange? Exiting without entering. Exiting without entering. That's a very, very good remark, eh? indeed. Uh, you don't expect the vehicles to blow up somewhere in the park and never come back. Um, uh, so maybe other suggestions? Long delays while in park. Sorry? Long delays while 
Long delay is one on the side. Yeah, yeah, but maybe people are traveling there for years, whereas it's only supposed to be a day trip. Very good. Entering and exiting through the same gate. Oh, okay, so these are already very nice remarks. So, okay, let's say that we're in, indeed interested in these uh, uh, vehicles that are coming in, always should come out. So the idea is that actually what we can do is we can, uh, using regular expressions, highlight these properties that we find interesting, such as the highlight of an entrance or the highlight of a camping, and then uh, we can color the data accordingly. And then what we can see in the data is that indeed the first vehicle is entering and exiting somewhere, the second vehicle is entering, visiting some camping and then exiting, and then we see that the third vehicle is actually still moving inside the park. Um, but okay, this is something that we can, uh, that we can reason about. So the idea now is that we can use automated techniques to help us find patterns in these sequences. And one of the very most simplistic techniques that we can apply is, for instance, applying clustering to see how often these sequences are happening and uh, to study frequent behavior. But what you will see in practice is that most of the times these sequences, they kind of look like each other, but they are slightly different with respect to one, of the, uh, one or two events. So this is actually the idea to use other types of techniques, such as process mining, to help us find overlap between these sequences and thereby uh, try to, to, to capture the main differences between them. So let's uh, get uh, to a demo of the system. So over here we have, uh, we have EventPad. And what we see over here, so this is, uh, we're now looking into approximately 170,000 events. And uh, what we can see is that now we have a bunch of, uh, of blocks. So if I hover my mouse over one of these blocks, then we can actually see the Excel row uh, that it corresponds to. And so this is, for instance, a two-axle car that is driving on uh, May 18th through Engine 3. And on the left-hand side, we have an overview of all the histograms that, we can, uh, that can tell us that most of the traffic is actually happening between uh, May and uh, September. And that, let me check, most of the, the, the vehicles are actually traveling from 6 a.m. until 7 p.m. Uh, so the thing is that the system is interactive, it's visualization, so what we can do is uh, if we're interested in, for instance, certain gates, then we can select it on the left-hand side and it will automatically highlight all the, 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 the gates that correspond to these in the sequences. Or the other way around, uh, if we make a selection on the right, we can see, for instance, that all the things that I've selected correspond to Fridays, Saturdays, and Tuesdays. Well, if we're interested indeed in these uh, entrance and exiting behavior, we can define regular expression rules. Um, and well, the idea is, is, uh, is very simple. What we can do is we can uh, choose a wildcard block, which is very similar to the wildcard operator in reg regex. And then if we, um, if we double click on it, we can add a constraint to it. So I'm not only interested in just the wildcards, I'm interested in uh, only the gates that correspond to entrances. So I can, for instance, make it an entrance. And if we apply this, then uh, I can replace it by a new block. And we can, for, for instance, design our own ones. Uh, in this case, I already designed an entrance. And if we highlight, uh, if, if we enable this rule, and then we can indeed see that the, most of the sequences indeed start and exit. I like the remark of, uh, of, of the person in front. Uh, so here we can indeed see that vehicles are entering and exiting immediately. Uh, so still the question whether it is the same entrance, but okay. Uh, and over here we see a sequence that uh, apparently does not exit nor enter. So does anybody may have an idea? The Rangers, right. Okay, of course, we forgot about them. So, okay, so maybe we should highlight these events as well. And indeed, uh, we can see that, uh, that, that these sequences also correspond to these Ranger vehicles. So the thing is that uh, we can uh, increasingly add some labels to the data that we find interesting, uh, such as the visit of campings, the visit of Ranger stops, uh, and maybe some generic gates that people can visit. And then we end up with uh, an enriched amount of data. Well, if I show you the mini-map, then we can see where, that we have quite some data. And yeah, if we want to discover some patterns in there, maybe we can use uh, other types of techniques, such as sorting. And if we sort the sequences, then we can see that some sequences definitely occur more often than others. Uh, so yeah, maybe it's interesting to see how often these sequences occur. Uh, because if, uh, I expect that these things that should not happen, that, they, uh, that these sequences should not occur that much. Well, here we can already see something interesting. Uh, like uh, there's this huge sequence of uh, people repeatedly visiting a camping, exiting, entering, and etc. And this actually in turn corresponded to a truck, that, uh, to a bus that was only active in the summer period from June till September, 
and we have uh, it's only active on Sundays, Fridays, and Mondays. But okay, this is uh, this was something that happened on accident, so that uh, doesn't really count. Um, well, if we sort the frequencies by frequency, uh, we can get a notion of, about what is frequent behavior. And we can see over here how many times these, uh, these vehicle patterns are actually occurring. If we want to get a better uh, overview of this, then we can, for instance, use uh, process mining to uh, help us discover patterns between the sequences. So we can make a selection on the left, and then what it will do is it will make a, a summary overview on the right. So basically, all the things that I've selected, they start with an entrance event, after which approximately 80% of the, uh, of 90% of, of the, 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 the second blocks are blue. And we can see indeed that 90% of the, of the sequences are blue. And we can continue building up the sequence. Well, we can now use, for instance, process mining techniques to help us figure out what kind of overlap exists between the sequences. And uh, that will, for instance, show us that, and indeed, most of the sequences that we actually selected, they enter and exit, like we expect. Uh, there are also indeed some vehicles that enter and exit immediately, and that in some cases, uh, uh, these sequences, they, uh, they often certain ga they visit gates more often than others. Well, if we want to, uh, to, to, to go more into, the, into the, 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 the data challenge, what we were interested in was how many times do certain vehicles visit in the first place. So what we can do is, for instance, count how many uh, the number of times these entrance and exit events are happening within a sequence. And for this, we can create a record expression rule using the concept that we've defined earlier by saying, OK, I want to have all the sequences that start with an entrance event. Um, I don't care what is happening after that. Um, it should end with an, an, an exit event. And the number of times this should happen can be zero or more times. Well, for the really nitpicky guys um, uh, among you, so uh, of course this, does, this pattern does not work entirely because it will do the longest match. And it will try to find the first uh, entrance and match it with the last one. So we can actually replace this one with an entrance event uh, that's anything but. And if we apply this rule, um, we can uh, assign a new block to this, vi call it a visit, a visitation, then uh, we can create the rule. The rule will be applied in the background, and indeed, like I expected, um, there are many of these sequences are actually visiting and exiting the, the, the vehicles uh, only once. <coughs> However, I, we can see indeed that these Ranger vehicles, they uh, are indeed not leaving, so this visit pattern does not work. But if we now filter on these visitation patterns, uh, like this, and make a, a separate selection for them, and let's call them visits, then um, we only end up with the sequences containing these purple blocks. And what, we'll, uh, what, we'll, what we will see is indeed that there are 17,000 cases where there is only one visit, and there indeed there is this very, the, the sequence that is uh, having many of these visits every uh, once in a while. Okay, so um, well, we, we can continue doing uh, analysis on this, uh, and then eventually the result is shown over here. So it actually turned out that in the network traffic, in, in, the, in the vehicle traffic data, there were, um, and we saw that there was this range of vehicles, we saw that there were these regular uh, vehicle patterns, and these range of vehicles, they had privileges. So they were allowed to, end, to, to enter areas that other ones weren't. And uh, these are actually indicated in these red blocks over here. And what we can actually see is that there are 23 cases where these red blocks are actually surrounded by an entrance and an exit event. But this was, this was fairly interesting because these uh, ranger vehicles were not allowed to exit these wild park in the first place. So this actually turned out to be uh, a vehicle dumping chemical waste in a certain area of the park for which they were not allowed, obviously. So the, the, the challenge in general took three months for, for teams uh, from academia and industry to finish. And uh, with the software, we actually managed to, to, to finish the, the, the challenge in two hours. So needless to say, we won the first prize with it, and after that, uh, I, we haven't seen any of the event data sets popping up in the upcoming events. So I think they're, they were pretty done with it. Um, so yeah, uh, of course, what does this have to do with the network traffic? Uh, nothing, but it just shows you that, uh, that, that, that the software can be used for other things. So this is actually a more interesting use case uh, of ransomware where we applied the, 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 the system to. And what we were studying was actually a hard disk drive installed at the university, and uh, we were just listening to all the Samba requests that were being sent. And what we can see over here uh, are these yellow blocks. So these are the open uh, file operations, close file, um, cl close file. Uh, the Ws are the writes, the Rs are the reads. 
And on the left-hand side, we can see two viruses, Jigsaw and Cryptex, that we discovered that at the moment this encryption happened generated a large amount of repetitive behavior in the network traffic. And if network traffic is something, then I, uh, I think network traffic is it's far from regular. Um, so I was kind of shocked to actually see this. So what we can actually see in the, in the Jigsaw was at the moment encryption happened, lots of files were being accessed in the, in the exact same way. And the fact that this algorithm was doing this in such a naive way, at trying to encrypt as many files as possible, was still something that shocked me. Uh, that in 2018, it is still possible for such a naive virus to do its work. Uh, so if I would have been the programmer of this algorithm, I would have done it way smarter. I like not doing all of the things at once, and maybe uh, shift and spread it over time, uh, and using different access patterns, these kind of things. Um, but still, we managed to, to find something interesting in there. Well, in case of the Jigsaw virus, we actually discovered that it was broken. So what we did was uh, we cut up actually the regular expression patterns that we saw. And then uh, what we can see is the, that uh, we have 700 cases where there were files being opened, the content was being read, and then the file was being deleted. And then in parallel, we actually had 700 sequences where the file was actually, a new file was being created, the encrypted uh, data was being written there, and then saved. However, the remove the deletion of the file and the creation of a new file happened completely separate from each other. So with hard disk recovery tools, we just managed to get 80% of all the original files back. Uh, and just to give an indication that, yeah, you don't have to be a very smart programmer to build these viruses. So another example, actually, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, things that we discovered was um, voice over IP um, fraud. So nowadays, many phone calls are actually being uh, hotwired over the internet. And um, there's a protocol called SIP that is used to initiate these phone calls. And so people are sending invites, you have to acknowledge this, uh, then the conversation is happening, and then you expect that people either say bye, or they, put, uh, the, 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 they, they close the conversation. And well, we were actually analyzing the SIP protocol over here, and yeah, well, we expected that these very simple patterns like one invite, one acknowledgement, one buy, one cancel, and then we saw indeed that there were some sequences that did not match any of these expectations. So in fact, some of them were actually um, uh, some server configuration issues that, were, that caused duplication of these packets, and there were also some cases where people were actually sending messages that were not adhering the, to the protocol. And this is something that you can see over here, the large uh, green sequences on the right were actually people trying to attempt to uh, hack a phone call. I will show you in a minute why this uh, can be very, uh, uh, very worthwhile doing it. So another example of, for instance, the treatments of patients. So this is actually a data set coming from a hospital where we had uh, people who had cat treatments. And then we asked to the hospital, hey, uh, what is something, what kind of behavior do you expect? Well, they said, well, I expect at least that these, uh, that these patients should visit the doctor and uh, they have an initial talk. And based on the talk, they uh, either get a light radiation treatment or heavy radiation treatment. And uh, if, that doesn't, uh, if that doesn't work, I usually you first try light and then do heavy. And in the last part, you see that there is this finishing talk to see if the patient was cured or need to have some additional medication. So indeed, uh, we can see in these, uh, in these alignments that this behavior is is, is more or less present. But we can also see cases where, for instance, patients immediately had heavy radiation treatment without having an intake. And so this is something that is not necessarily bad, right? So if you think about it, it could, for instance, be a patient uh, who is being transferred from another hospital. Uh, but the thing is that you need to be aware that these kind of things happen. And the trick with also with these targeted attacks is that they typically will use this kind of behavior to get inside systems that you uh, at first did not expect. So this is actually an example where uh, you have a certain level of expectation and you can see anomalies, but because we label the data, we can suddenly add, uh, we can explain the things, we can see what is happening. So yeah, after the PhD, the whole thing kind of exploded. So I've really given this talk quite, some number, quite a number of times at conferences. We were allowed to present this at Black Hat. Uh, so it's the biggest hacker conference in the world. Um, well, after that, uh, I wasn't sure that my laptop wasn't hacked. Uh, so I, had, I should have bought the burner equipment. Um, well, and it just continued on and on. So uh, we presented it at, uh, we used it on a large amount of cases, not only on network traffic, but also on financial transactions, uh, user surveys. Uh, people just wanted to be able to visualize the data and label it. 
So yeah, that of course remains the question, what's next? Uh, so I finished the PhD, uh, research is done, I don't have to do anything with it, so uh, is this it? Well, in fact, uh, we, we, we received a lot of comments also from, uh, from people from, uh, the, uh, from the universe of academia, from industry, uh, that we should continue on this. So we managed to get some funding to actually scale up the system and make it also available uh, for research purposes. Um, and actually the case that we're now working on as a startup analyzed data is uh, in, in the telco fraud. So the idea is, is very simple. Hackers nowadays, they buy premium numbers. So these are like numbers for which you have to pay $10 a minute and you can buy them on the internet. It's not, uh, not big of a deal. And then hackers are trying to locate phone devices that do not have, uh, that have a bad username or password or what you typically see is that many phone devices are actually connected to a server that is uh, transferring these phone calls over the internet because it's cheaper. So you can imagine that if a hacker can gain access to such a server and then also to all the phone devices that are attached to the server, that again, dialing your own premium number, well, it's, uh, it's definitely beneficial. And so every minute that these people are dialing, you get money and uh, yeah, the, the owner of the phone device will get the bills of 10,000 euros and more. So we actually used the, the, the visualization software to see what, how we can prevent this kind of fraud from happening and develop the software system for this to actually prevent this uh, fraud from being happening by actively analyzing this network traffic. So um, the few takeaway messages that I want to give to you is that uh, in, in principle, if you want to protect your systems, uh, you have to know, you have to understand what is happening in there. Uh, you cannot just rely on some automated technique that you will just plug in it will generate some uh, outliers. Well, definitely you will find outliers, uh, and, but it, it can take quite some time to actually filter them out manually. Whereas if you start thinking about the things that should happen in your system and then try to dissect all this behavior bit by bit, um, that, uh, that you're actually able to, to manage to find something that you did not expect. So uh, the solution is never just AI, especially in security. Uh, so if, if you have this magical black box algorithm that says that, well, there's a 70% chance that, uh, that your network is compromised, then this is definitely not enough uh, information to decide to turn off your network. Or uh, uh, believe me, you, you can laugh about it. I have heard stories where people did it and it cost them a lot of money. <laughs> And finally, yeah, so it's not difficult to find anomalies in general. And so you, outliers, it's, it's not, finding the outliers is not a challenge, but finding the ones that actually are in, uh, indicators of compromise is uh, what, what's the biggest issue. So I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the, the, the talk. Um, if, you, if you want to contact me, if, you, if you're interested in, the, in, in using the system, we're currently scaling it up, uh, but I also have a Windows and a Unix version uh, that is uh, available from the academia that you can use. Uh, and if there are no questions, then uh, thank you for listening. You need to know what the normal is. Um, so this is uh, probability uh, theory, I think. Yep. Uh, so how much data do you need in order to um, to know the difference between an anomaly and the normal? Okay, so the question was um, how much data you actually need to get a notion of what's normal behavior in, in, inside your network. Uh, and of course, this is a very difficult question. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have too little data, then uh, based on too many little data points, you may start overgeneralizing and your conclusions may not be accurate. Whereas if you have a too long training period, you might actually risk of finding uh, all the outliers and uh, also being becoming part of normal behavior. Uh, so in general, um, this really differs per application. Uh, so the, the nice thing about this approach is that you can, you do not necessarily need to have a training data because the normal model is kind of inside your head. So especially if you have some, if you want to do some initial exploration, you can use these kind of tools and then you can start figuring out what normal behavior should be. Uh, I hope that answers the question. So uh, the, the question was how, um, how often does it uh, need, uh, so how, how long does it take to build a model of, of, of this data and then, for instance, try to use it on the software? If, uh, yep. So what you saw was that during the analysis, during the demo, we were creating these rules of uh, properties that we find interesting, and like these entrance events, these exit events, these uh, number of times cars are visiting, and these rules are actually built here on the spot. 
And so these, the, we can use these color rules. Uh, they, they were created here on the spot. It's not like that you need any training data for that. Based on this labeling, the automated techniques that we provide can use this information immediately to start generating some patterns out of that. Um, so yeah, for, for, for this demo, there was no, no, no training phase necessary. If we uh, like uh, to use the software, where can we download it? What license does it have? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, at the moment, so we received funding from the, uh, from, uh, from the government to scale up the application. And this, the system that we have designed now is basically an academics tool on steroids. Uh, so it has been, uh, been overdeveloped for quite a number of years and we are now revisiting the code base and trying to improve on it. So um, because I don't want uh, people to, uh, to, to be disappointed if, if there are any bugs or anything, um, I, have put it, uh, I have no longer made it available on the website. If people definitely would like to try out the system, then just feel free to contact me. Uh, the, the contact details are in the bottom. I have a Windows version, I have a Unix version, so, um, and then you can just uh, work on it uh, as you want. So I'm also still, uh, one day a week, I'm a postdoc, total researcher at the university, so we're always interested in uh, trying to explore the boundaries of the system and the techniques and the challenges that people are facing in, uh, in, 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 in industry. So um, we can always uh, uh, think of, for instance, about collaborations where we start up research projects with students or uh, yeah, see uh, how we can help you uh, in, an, in, in that way. Uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, you're uh, looking at static data. Are there plans to look at the live data, so stuff happening right now? In, in, in the company, so we actually do. So, uh, so what we now did was uh, we did some static analysis, uh, but you can imagine that the, these rules that we apply are very efficient to apply uh, in practice, uh, also live on data, because these are regular expressions and they have linear uh, time complexity. Um, so what we actually now did was we did some analysis using the software, and now we managed to find, to make a system that can real time detect this kind of fraud based on the patterns that we have observed. Uh, and thereby actually trying to prevent this fraud from happening by early trying, by trying to, to detect as early as possible uh, yeah, this bad behavior in these, in these conversations. And you can in, indeed do that in linear time? Yeah, so for, for, the, for the rules that were, for the type of, uh, of, of regular expressions that we defined over here, we can do this in linear time, yes. Cool. And it's mostly because we do not directly take timing information into account uh, because that will uh, kind of increase the complexity of it. But for many cases, the, it's not necessary. Last question, by the way. If I saw this, it seems so easy to do. Uh, so there is something that gives me the feeling that uh, everybody could have thought of it. Uh, so there must be things you haven't told. What was hard about finding the solution? Very good question. So, uh, so in general, the, the, the system is, is easy to use. And we have shown this also in cases where we were studying user surveys and people without any knowledge uh, of computers could, were able to color these blocks and start playing with them, uh, literally. Um, the hardest part is actually the mechanics that is happening uh, underneath the engine, uh, where, the, uh, where the, the, the algorithms take the dynamic labels that you have generated into account to create more, uh, to find anomalies that are more in your uh, area of interest. So it requires a lot of tuning on, on existing algorithms to make this possible. Uh, but this is something that, as a user, you should not care about. And so the, the fact that you define these labels uh, enables you to find these anomalies that you're interested in. So there are obviously some downsides to it, uh, because since you already uh, uh, indicate your area of interest, that uh, you might walk, go into a biased way of looking at your data uh, without maybe finding the true optimal path. But for many investigations, especially if you have no clue what's in your data, it's already sufficient to go into this local direction and then start exploring the, 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 the true optimal part in your data in an automatic way after obtaining these insights. Okay. Well, great. Th thank you very much. It looks very, very interesting. Okay. Um, I, I hope you send in a, in a bug fix to the Jigsaw de uh, developer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I thanks. will. Great. <laughs> great. Thank you. Okay.